that as a metaphor for our lives. He says, if we purge ourselves of all of these, meaning the ignoble aspects, then we become a fit vessel for the master's service. Very important, last phrase, prepared for every good work. The same language that's used in 2 Timothy 3.16 for sacred scripture, that the man of God may be prepared for every good work. Same, same exact words. Well, if scripture alone is all we need, well then, to purify ourselves from all that is a noble must be all we need. We can't have two things that are all we need. There's more than one. And, and the second verse is James chapter 1, verse 4, where St. James says, Let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire and lacking in nothing. Now that is a stronger, uh, if, if you're going to argue for a sola, I think you got a stronger argument for sola paciencia here in James 1, 4 than you do for sola scriptura in 2 Timothy 3, 16. But the bottom line is, these verses are not telling us scripture is all we need, or to purify ourselves is all we need, or patience is all we need. No, we need all of the above and more, which leads me to the last verse that really popped for me, and that is Matthew 18, 53, <coughs> where Jesus gives us the perennial instructions as to what we are to do if we have, for example, a, a serious disagreement about scripture. He says, if your brother offends you, Go tell him his fault between you and him. And there's no greater offense than to accuse someone of heresy. You've got the wrong interpretation of 2 Timothy 3.16, right? What does Jesus say to do? You go to your brother. If you can't settle it, you take one or two with you. If you still can't settle it, take it to the church. And according to Jesus, if you read the text, it's the church that has the final say. Not scripture. For me, done deal. Sola Scriptura contradicts sacred scripture. The reformers claimed that the only authority a Christian needed was the Bible. And the Bible clearly teaches what Christians ought to believe. But even reformers like Zwingli, Luther, and many others disagreed about what the Bible actually taught. This led to debate, dissension, and even violence. In January 1525, a group of Zwingli's followers felt that he hadn't gone far enough. They taught that infant baptisms were invalid, and so many adults needed to be baptized again. Zwingli disagreed, but the dispute between these groups couldn't be resolved with scripture, because the Bible never explicitly condemns rebaptism. The prohibition on rebaptism was a tradition within the church for over a thousand years. But for the Reformers, Scripture was their sole authority. In 1526, the Zurich City Council passed an ordinance banning adult rebaptism. And a few months later, Felix Mainz, a member of the newly formed Swiss Anabaptist movement, became the first person to be convicted of that crime. His punishment? Death by drowning. Mainz was put on a boat and carried out to Lake Zurich, where he was bound to a pole and thrown over. His last words were, Into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. While some reformers refused to follow Zwingli, Zwingli himself refused to follow the arch-reformer, Martin Luther. In October of 1529, Luther and Zwingli met at Marburg Castle in the region of Hesse, Germany, to debate the issue of Christ's presence in the Eucharist. Philip I of Hesse called the meeting to try and unite the Protestant churches, but the Eucharist remained a key source of division. Luther denied the Catholic view that the bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ, but he did believe the Eucharistic bread and wine were united to Christ's body and blood in something he called a sacramental union. Zwingli, on the other hand, believed that the bread and wine were merely symbols of Christ's body and blood, and Christ was not actually present in them. He said, The works that God commands are for our enemy. God is strong and light, and he leads us not into the darkness. Consequently, he does not mean this is my body in a literal, actual, physical sense, which contradicts the scriptures. It is the oracles of demons that are obscure, not the maxims of Christ. It is a matter of historical fact 
reality that we live in today, that there are literally tens of thousands of Protestant denominations that have resulted from this chaotic principle of sola scriptura. You know, some of my Protestant friends push back and they say, well, you know, there's not really tens of thousands of denominations, right? They'll point to a particular uh, world uh, Christian encyclopedia that refers to 33,000 denominations back in 2001. It's not really that many. Well, the fact is we don't know, and nobody knows how many denominations there actually are. I argue there's actually more than 33,000 denominations because the principle of sola scriptura has led to storefront churches, churches in people's living rooms, and, and so forth. Because, hey, nobody has any more authority than anyone else. This is a big problem. Now, you juxtapose that with the Catholic faith that was presented to me all those years ago by a young Catholic Marine, where we have what St. Paul refers to in Ephesians 4, 5 as one Lord, one faith, one baptism. For 2,000 years, you never have a single contradiction of a definitive teaching either of the Pope or the bishops in union with the Pope that has gone before it or uh, changed by one that comes after it. I mean, this is astonishing. I set out actually to find one contradiction, and I could not do it. I had to ask the question, which one of these models and historic realities fits the prophecy of our Lord and Savior in John 10, 16, where he prophesied there shall be one fold and one shepherd? I mean, it is night and day, obvious. It's the Catholic Church. In John 17, 11, Jesus prayed to the Father and said this, And now I am no more in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Jesus wanted his church to be united, and that is impossible if each believer decides for himself what the Bible teaches. St. Peter recognized this error in his own time when he wrote, no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. And he said of St. Paul's letters, there are some things in them hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. This is why Jesus did not teach sola scriptura, but founded a church built on Peter and the other apostles. In fact, prior to his ascension into heaven, Jesus never commanded the apostles to write anything down. Instead, their mission was to preach the gospel. Paul even thanked the Thessalonians for accepting his preaching, not as human words, but as the very words of God. Absolutely crucial that we understand this. The word of God, according to sacred scripture, does not come to us through scripture alone. There, St. Paul plainly says that the spoken tradition, the oral tradition, is just as much the Word of God. Because remember, this is First Thessalonians, right? He hadn't written anything yet. This is his first letter. He's probably writing about 52, and he says, we've already communicated the Word of God to you in spoken form. Absolutely crucial that we understand the Word of God comes in both written and oral form according to the New Testament. The first Christians didn't learn their faith from the Bible because the Bible didn't exist yet. During this time, the Word of God was transmitted orally from Jesus to the apostles and their disciples through what is called sacred tradition. Paul refers to this when he commends the Corinthians for maintaining the traditions, even as I have delivered them to you, and instructs his disciple Timothy to take what you have heard from me before many witnesses in trust to faithful men, who will be able to teach others also. Eventually, some of this oral proclamation of God's word was written down and became scripture. But even after that happened, God's word and tradition remained. When Paul tells the Christians in the Greek city of Thessalonica to stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter, he is exhorting them to obey God's word in both its forms. It's important to remember that sacred tradition is not the same as the customs and practices associated with the church that can change over time, like 
manners of dress or styles of liturgy. We call this tradition with a lowercase t. Tradition with a capital T refers to the word of God that is handed on or delivered and does not change, even though our understanding of it may grow over time, just as our understanding of scripture grows over time. The Greek word for tradition is paradosis, which means what is given over. In the second century, St. Irenaeus said the following, while the languages of the world are diverse, nevertheless, the authority of the tradition is one and the same. What if the apostles had not, in fact, left writings to us? Would it not be necessary to follow the order of tradition, which was handed down to those to whom they entrusted the churches? One of the things that people often misunderstand is the concept of tradition. Tradition comes from a Latin word that means to hand on. So anything that's handed on is itself an item of tradition. The Christian faith is something that has been handed down to us from Jesus and the apostles. And so the Christian faith is itself tradition. Within that, there are different ways that things can be handed down. St. Paul tells the Thessalonians to honor all of the traditions they've received from him, whether in writing or orally. And that's the approach that the early Christians took. The teaching of the apostles was authoritative, whether they had received it through oral transmission or through written transmission. And we don't see a change on that at the end of the apostolic period. There's no place where the apostles say, by the way, after we're all dead, forget everything we said and just focus on what we wrote. They never say that. Instead, they depict Jesus and the Holy Spirit being with the church throughout the rest of church history. The Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with hands defiled? And he said to them, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold fast the tradition of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. One of the things that Jesus critiqued in his own day was what he called traditions of men. We read, for example, in the Gospel of Mark, how various Jewish groups were using a particular tradition called korban, which means devoted to God as a way of getting around the obligation to support their parents. They would take money that their parents needed in their old age and say, well, this money is now korban. It's now devoted to God, so it's not going to go to you and to help you maintain a dignified lifestyle in your old age. Jesus said this was in contradiction to the commandment to honor your father and mother. And so he said, by this tradition of men, you've made void the word of God. And so we see that traditions of men, traditions that are not of divine origin, can conflict with the word of God. But not all traditions do, because Jesus himself passed on his teachings orally as a matter of oral tradition. Later, some of them were written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But at the same time, there was also a continuing oral transmission of these same teachings. And so it's not the traditions of men we should be listening to but it is the traditions of the apostles. Sacred tradition is a living transmission of God's word received from Jesus and the Holy Spirit to the successors of the apostles. And this is one of the reasons why it's important, because along with sacred scripture, it is a means by which the early Christians transmitted God's revelation. And this living transmission involved the apostolic preaching, the living testimony of the apostles, and the ceremonial observances. For example, in Acts, that we read about in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 46, the prayers, the breaking of the bread, etc. Now, as a result of this, the Catechism goes on to state in paragraph 82 that we don't derive certainty about all of revealed truths from Scripture alone. Because sacred tradition is a means of transmitting God's revelation, in order to get the full and clear picture 
of God's revelation, we must look to both and not Scripture alone. And then finally, sacred tradition is important because we need sacred tradition to even know what Scripture is. Perhaps the clearest example of a sacred tradition all Christians recognize is the canon of Scripture. The word canon comes from a Greek word that means rule and refers to the church's official list of inspired writings. This list comprises the table of contents in every Bible, Protestant and Catholic. However, Catholics have a justification for why we should believe this list has the same authority as the biblical books that come after it. If the Catholic Church is divine authority from Christ, then the Church would have the power to recognize and pronounce the true canon of Scripture. The Bible shows that Christ not only rose from the dead, but he established a church built on the apostles. The successors of the apostles, or the popes and bishops who inherited the apostles' spiritual authority, were then able to authoritatively declare the Bible to be the Word of God. At the end of the first century, Clement of Rome, the fourth pope, said this, Our apostles knew through our Lord Jesus Christ that there would be strife for the office of bishop. For this reason, therefore, having received perfect foreknowledge, they appointed those who have already been mentioned, and afterward added the further provision that if they should die, other approved men should succeed to their ministry. This is not a circular argument in which an inspired Bible is used to prove the church's authority, and the church's authority is used to prove the Bible is inspired. Instead, as the Catholic apologist Carl Keating says, it's a spiral argument in which the Bible is assumed to be a merely human document. From there, we can show that Christ rose from the dead and established a church. This church then had the authority to pronounce which human writings also had God as their author. St. Augustine reached a similar conclusion in the 4th century when he said, I should not believe the gospel except as moved by the authority of the Catholic Church. Pope Damasus first promulgated the canon at the Synod in Rome, and it was later defined at the regional councils of Hippo and Carthage. The Church reaffirmed the canon at the Ecumenical Council of Trent after the Protestant